College of Business, and I'm very glad to see such a nice crowd here. So welcome to everybody. As a matter of housekeeping, those of you who are here for class credit, make sure that you picked up a event participation card and make sure that you leave your card filled out at the back on the back table. So make sure you process that so you get the credit you deserve. All right. It's my honor to introduce our speaker for today, Tom Barkin. He is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. He joined the Richmond Fed in January of this year. In this role, he is responsible for the bank's monetary policy, bank supervision and regulation, and payment services as well as oversight of the Federal Reserve System's Information Technology Organization. Mr. Barkin serves as a voting member in 2018 on the Federal Reserve's Chief Monetary Policy Body, the Federal Open Market Committee. Prior to joining the Richmond Fed, he was a senior partner and chief risk officer, as well as chief financial officer at McKinsey and Company, a worldwide management consulting firm. He oversaw McKinsey's offices in the Southern United States and provided strategic counsel to a diverse portfolio of clients. Mr. Barkin also served on the board of directors for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta from 2009 to 2014 and was the board <laughs> chairman from 2013 to 2014. He is a member of the Emory University Board of Trustees and the Greater Washington Partnership. Tom Barkin is a native of Tampa, Florida and attended Harvard University, where he earned his undergraduate, his master's of business administration, and his law degree. It is my honor to welcome him, and he deserves a great round of applause. Um, so it's great to be here. A couple things of housekeeping before I get started. Um, first of all, I didn't know that those forms were event participation things. I thought they were ballots for the Mr. Marshall company. <laughs> and so if you do want to fill my name in, I'm available. Uh, second, this is going to be a bit of a test because at 218 today, uh, the president's emergency FEMA alert is going to come through. So everyone who has a cell phone, the whole place is going to go nuts at 218 p.m. today, if it works. Okay. I will not take that as a buzzer that says I ought to get off of the air or anything else, but we may need to take a quick break while we have the emergency broadcast system uh, working. Or you may even want to turn off your cell phone just as an idea. Um, before I get started, how many of you feel like you have a great view of what the Federal Reserve does? Excellent. So um, why don't I start by talking just a little bit about that? Um, uh, so first of all, uh, has anyone ever had uh, a paycheck direct debited into your account? written a check, I know it's a different generation. We process all the payments uh, in the US, so those stuff are all coming through from us. Uh, second of all, we actually have the body that monitors the health of the economy and sets interest rates. So we set interest rates. We process cash, old cash that's worn out, we turn it into new cash, and no, you can't have any. So we do that, the third thing. And we oversee, we regulate banks. So uh, to the extent that you're worried about whether the banks are safe or whether uh, we're going to have another crisis like the crisis of 2008. That's the kind of thing we oversee to. So that's what we do. Um, central banks historically in our country have been controversial. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, for those of you who've heard of him, he's a lot more popular recently. Um, he started the first one that lasted about 10 or 15 years. Uh, the second one was blown up in the Andrew Jackson administration. And then there was a big panic in New York uh, in the late night in 1907. And after that, they put together the Federal Reserve System to try to be our, our, uh, our central bank and do all the stuff that I just talked about. It's set up in a very strange way, but it's a way that sort of worked politically. There are 12 individual Federal Reserve banks in 12 different parts of the country. I'm in Richmond, which means we cover South Carolina through Maryland, including 
West Virginia. So you are officially now in my territory. But there's one in Philadelphia that covers Pennsylvania, and one in Boston that covers New England, and one in San Francisco that covers the West Coast, uh, et cetera. And then there are governors in DC who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. I'm not appointed by the president or confirmed by the Senate. We've got individual boards. And the governors in DC, you may have heard of Ben Bernanke or Janet Yellen. Right now, the guy in charge is Jay Powell. And so we meet every six weeks, discuss the state of the economy, and we set interest rates. So that's what we do. OK, how many people here now understand what the Federal Reserve System does? I still only got 40%. I'm not going to do it again, though. Um, I thought what I might do, I did a, I have a whole prepared speech, which I've decided now I'm not going to bore you with. Um, uh, but what I will talk a little bit of it is how did I get here? And then uh, because there are some slides here and because you guys are used to going to class, I may just show you my five favorite charts uh, from the last year of doing this. I will warn you in advance that my five favorite charts are nerd charts. I'm an economist working in the Federal Reserve System, but it may give you a little bit of insight uh, into the economy. And then when I'm done with that, um, I'm totally open for questions. I believe this is all being live streamed, so if you have any really good questions, you can feel free to put me on the spot in that, in that way. Um, and so feel free to ask on most anything you want. Um, as Gene said, I grew up in Tampa, uh, went to Harvard, and then came back to work for McKinsey Company in Atlanta. Um, uh, what she didn't say is that I'm a, a passionate sports fan, a big golfer, uh, a passionate community leader, and a smart aleck. And I will at least demonstrate the last one to you at some point today. I was on the board of the Fed in Atlanta for six years. Uh, that was 09 to 14. Uh, during that time, uh, the economy was in a real rut. Um, we met every six weeks to discuss, about, discuss what should happen on interest rates. We didn't once actually vote for an increase or a decrease because the rates were at zero the entire time. And so uh, it was an interesting experience. You got to see uh, the Federal Reserve leadership, which I really respected as people who stepped in and took charge of an economy that was in crisis. And I, I believe then and believe now uh, did a lot of stuff that was uh, unbelievably instrumental in having the economy be as healthy as it is today. Uh, I was nearing retirement, though I look quite young. And, um, uh, and when I got the call, I thought, this is a great way to try to give back, right? To be part of an institution uh, that has a noble <coughs> mission, trying to take care of the economy of this country, to uh, get involved in public service, which I encourage you, know, you guys to be involved in if you have the opportunity, and a chance to learn and expand, digging into economics, digging into public policy, uh, and the like. And, and in that role, I'm trying to do four things. First of all, the room is full with a lot of unbelievably talented people, bankers, regulators, macroeconomists. Um, I'm really the only person in the room whose background is being in business. And I was in business for 30 years. And when we talk about things like tariffs, or we talk about things like tax cuts, and we talk about how firms respond, I think I've got something unique and different uh, to add. Uh, second thing I'm about is we're in Richmond, but our district is quite wide, as I described earlier. And we ought to be on the ground everywhere. So I'm in West Virginia. I was in Charleston this morning. Um, you know, for a reason, which is to get to know the state, get to know the people in the state, the business in the state. And I've been doing that in South Carolina, North Carolina, Maryland, D.C., uh, and the like. And it really is very different, right? Charleston is not Charleston, uh, South Carolina is nothing like Charleston, West Virginia. I learned that, and uh, and on and on. And so, trying to get into the markets and understand this is a big deal. Third thing I'm passionate about is our community, as I said earlier. And I do think the Fed offers a platform to do important stuff for the communities. And in particular, uh, issues of labor market outcomes. Do people have jobs? Do they have good jobs? Uh, those are the kind of thing that's right at the center of our mission. And the answer isn't the same everywhere in the district. Um, there are places where you have very high employment rates. Uh, there are places like certain counties in southern West Virginia where you have very low employment rates. Um, high participation, low participation, high incomes or not. And what drives that, whether it be geography uh, or gender or race, um, or ethnicity are all things that are interesting uh, to us and things that we're doing research on. And finally, with 30 years of management, I thought I might be able to bring something to the system. That's probably the hardest of all of these four. But we do oversee IT in Richmond, and that means we're at the front lines of the cyber defense and the financial system, which is another uh, interesting part of my role. Um, so I like getting out in the markets. You know, why do I? Well, take West Virginia, for example. Uh, labor force participation in West Virginia is 50%. Um, that's by eight points the lowest 
of any other state in the country. And so trying to understand what's going on in the market is a pretty important thing. And I wouldn't uh, ignore the fact that we make a lot of decisions based on facts. I'll show you a few in a second. But the facts are old and frequently revised. And so trying to actually understand what's happening is usually uh, important. So with that introduction, maybe I'll bore you for just 10 seconds with what's going on in the economy. Turn to my five favorite facts and then throw it open to questions. Um, uh, the first thing is, how many of you are seniors? This is a great time to graduate, because, but you may not want to graduate. I didn't want to when I was a senior. But uh, the economy is as healthy as it's been uh, in my memory. Uh, growth in the economy in the last quarter was over 4%. Most people think uh, for this year it'll be uh, well over 3%. That's a very healthy uh, growth rate. Um, what's underlying that is confidence. Uh, consumers have jobs, markets are strong, and so consumers are spending. Businesses see uh, tailwinds rather than headwinds, and they're investing in the future, and they're investing in growth. Um, I've heard in West Virginia there's a Toyota plant that's just been announced, there's a Hino plant that's just been announced. But wherever you talk to businesses, you see people say, you know what, we've had a tax cut, we've had fiscal stimulus, we're in a deregulatory moment, this is a time where I can grow. And that's a great time uh, to enter the market. The labor markets are extremely strong. Um, unemployment is under 4%. That's as low as it's been since the late 60s. Um, we're adding jobs at about 200,000 per month. Uh, if you want to think about break even, it's more like 80 to 100,000 a month. So at 200,000 jobs a month, that's very healthy. For the last four or five months, the number of vacancies has been bigger than the number of people looking for work, which is actually incredible. That's never been the case in the 20 years that those two uh, indices work together. But there are more vacancies than there are people working, looking for work, which is why I said it's a great time to be a senior. Um, you know, there are things we're looking at on the employment front. One of the biggest ones is labor force participation. Um, as my generation gets old and retires, um, You've got a lot more students going to school. The percent of people in the labor force is actually dropping. And that's kind of a challenge for us as an economy, because if you'd like to grow the economy, you need more people in the labor force. Uh, immigration has also dropped. That's another reason you're seeing less, less growth in the labor force. And so that's, that's a place to, to watch the labor force. But right now, you know, we're adding jobs at a wonderful clip. We also care about inflation. Our, our mandate is maximum employment and stable prices. So we care about inflation, price increases. Now that's been quite stable, right? Our target is 2%. For the last several months, we've been exactly on 2% in terms of core price increases. Um, you know, the one place that you might look and say, wait a second, the labor markets are really tight, but prices aren't rising, wages aren't rising, why is that? And that's something we spend a lot of time trying to understand. Um, part of it is that uh, the world at large expects inflation to be tight. I mean, to be stable at the rates that we're uh, putting it. And so if you think inflation is going to be 2%, you're not going to give your workers 5 or 6% wage increases. You don't think you can pass that on. Uh, another reason is competition. Uh, the transparency of the internet, big box retailers, private label, foreign competition, all keep prices down. So that's another thing people are working at. But again, we step back from it, and we see strong growth. We see stable prices. And we see uh, employment growth that's extremely strong and getting and continues strong, you know, over 200,000 a month for five years. So with that backdrop, let me see if this works and I can show you my five favorite charts. And it's always the real one to point it out. <coughs> you, if you that computer right now, you try to push the arrow on it. Or is it that? Is it a different computer? Two charts. Next one. Okay, so uh, again, I said I'm nervous, so just deal with it. Right? This is business investment, and the uh, green line is what is actual, and the uh, purple line is what would be predicted given the economy and corporate profits and market values. And what you see is that model worked pretty good until about 2005. But since then, you see investment at far lower levels than you would have expected. Why does that matter? Well, business investment is how you grow, right? Business investment helps you with productivity. Business investment is how you get new jobs. And why would business investment be down? 
Well, and we shouldn't forget 2008. That was a pretty shattering year for most of all of us. And if you had been through 2008, you might wake up the next day and say, you know what? It's, I'm a little nervous about whether I'm going to make a big investment in a plant or in a factory because who knows what tomorrow looks like. Um, a lot of businesses believe that regulation increased in the time after 2008. And if you felt like you know your opportunities and upside were going to be limited, maybe you wouldn't invest. Maybe you don't know if you can get workers in the economy that's as tight as it is. Maybe businesses are being more short term and thinking hard about delivering money to shareholders as opposed to investing in the future. But regardless, that's actually an issue for us because it implies an economy that's not growing at the level that it could and an opportunity for us because if that investment comes back, you can actually imagine the growth that we're on continuing for some time. So that's the first of my five favorites. <clears throat> Sorry, can I pose on you? But it worked. Okay, second is productivity. And again, this is annual growth in productivity year over year. You can see back in the 50s and 60s, it used to run about 3%. It dropped a lot in the 70s. We had a huge uh, set of issues with the economy back then. But it came back in the 90s. And then in the late 90s, we had a huge boom in productivity. And this was the internet and computerization and all of that stuff. And if productivity is this big, that's awesome for the economy because you get growth, you get all kinds of positive uh, outcomes. But now look again, it's dropped in the last 10 years. Okay, so again, if productivity is high, right, the economy grows faster. If productivity is low, it grows slower. So we actually do care about productivity. And what's going on here? Again, one of the breakpoints is 08. Right, if you look at it, you see it started to drop a little before 08, but it really accelerated the drop then. And Again, maybe business investment's part of the story. Another part of the story is uh, the, the rate of startups in this country has dropped hugely over the last 20 years. And startups bring a lot of innovation to the economy and a lot of new productivity. It doesn't feel like that if you read about Facebook or, uh, or any of the other high-tech startups. But across the economy, the rate of startups is down and down considerably. And so again, trying to look hard at that productivity and asking the question whether some of the innovations that are happening today might be or relevant is the second thing I like to look at. Third, all right, uh, so this is wage increases. Okay, so think about wage increases in two categories. There's people who are out in the free market looking for jobs, and there are people who already have jobs. So the blue line is wage increases for people who switch jobs. And the yellow line is for uh, people who already have jobs and keep their jobs. Okay? Now, it's pretty much always the case that you get more money for switching to jobs and staying in jobs. But if you look at this data, back in 2000, <coughs> these numbers were about 5, 5.5%. Back in 2008, they were about 4%. Today, they've barely gotten to 3 Okay? So this is what I meant earlier when I said that wage increases are not as high as you would expect for as busy as the economy Now, what's interesting, what's interesting about it is the gap between switchers and staff. And when I'm talking to businesses, one of the questions I'm asking is, how much money are you going to give to the people who stay in the job? And they're still very focused on 2 to 3%. They have expectations of inflation. They have expectations of needs. And employees aren't switching jobs the way that they used to. And I don't know whether we would still call you guys millennials, maybe you're the next, whatever the next generation we haven't named yet. But the story on millennials, the theory of millennials is that they're not very loyal and they switch jobs. That's actually not true in fact. The generation that is uh, you know, 21 to 30 actually changes jobs less often than their uh, forebears. And maybe that's because they've joined places that they like better, that treat them nicer. Maybe it's because compensation is not as big a deal compared to things like lifestyle or the values of the institution. Um, maybe it's just a hangover from 2008, and if your dad or your friend lost their job in 2008, you're not going to leave a good job for another one. But what's going on behind here is lower turnover than we're used to, and therefore lower pressure on compensation that we're used to seeing at this point in the cycle. Uh, the fourth chart, and I'll be interested in how you think about this. Uh, this is pricing. Okay, so. 
This takes you back to 1960 and it has three different lines. There's uh, services, haircuts, there's uh, durables, refrigerators, and there's non durables, cleaners. Okay? All of them get sold, and you'll see for until the mid 80s, and maybe even until the mid 90s, they pretty much increased prices at about the same rate, whatever the inflation of the economy they all But now they've moved massively. Right, so the services prices have actually increased quite consistently. They are four x what they were way back home, whereas durable prices have actually dropped rather than going the other way. Part of our mission is inflation, and part of our question is what's driving prices. Well, think about the difference between buying a haircut and how you compete that versus buying a, a refrigerator or a tire, and how you compete that. I mean, uh, you just go to the barber and you get your haircut as opposed to going online and shopping things, or going to a Home Depot where uh, they've got a great huge purchasing organization that is beating people up for competitors. The haircut is still done locally. The refrigerator might be manufactured in South Korea. And so you've got a set of pressures on these durables that you don't have on services that are causing a real dichotomy in terms of who's able to raise price and who isn't. So again, uh, that's something we worry about uh, as economists. Sorry. Two twenty-two. So we've actually missed the president's emergency alarm. One more. Okay. Now I'm going to get a little arcane for you. This is the yield curve. Um, I assume most people don't know what the yield curve is, but it is the difference between the short-term treasury rate and the long-term treasury. So right now the long-term treasuries are about three point one percent. The short-term treasury is about two-year treasury is about two point eight five percent, and the three-month treasury is about two and a quarter. Okay, when those rates are all those, and normally you would imagine that the longer you invest for, the more money you get, right? It's the difference between investing overnight or in a savings account versus ten years. But what's happened over the last several years is that spread's got much much smaller, and. Uh, we get asked a lot of questions, and we worry about what signal is the market telling us. If you believe that markets are intelligent, which we do, what signal are you taking out of the fact that those spreads are smaller than they used to be? One fact is when the spread when it's gotten perfectly flat, in other words, the short term and the long term rates are the same. Um, seven of the last six times, six of the last seven of the last six times that has happened, um, the economy has gone into recession. So it's not a perfect indicator, but when that happens. Right, you see a recession soon after in the next 18 months or so. And if you look at the right hand side of that chart, you can see that spread is coming down. So we're asking ourselves about whether there's a recession. This is particularly important for those of you who are sophomores and juniors, as you're going to be in the job market in you know, a year or two. And so we are spending a lot of time trying to understand what drives that. How much of that is signal from the market, and how much of that is people are putting money into the 10 year treasury because it's a safe asset. So I told you that'd be a nerd thing, and I just wanted to make sure you you talk through those five charts. But I want to come back to you know where I started, which is Federal Reserve System. Our job is trying to take care as best we can of the economy. We see an economy uh, that's extremely strong, with growth that's solid, with unemployment that's at historic lows, and with price inflation that's quite stable. And so we don't worry so much about today. We're just trying to do our best to help keep this going for tomorrow. And with that, I'll throw it open to questions. Yeah, I've got one. Uh, do you think the economy is in danger of overheating because of tax cuts combined with a low unemployment rate? Now you're reading that question. Where did that question come from? I wrote it down earlier whenever you were talking about it. I wanted to get it right. No, I didn't know. <laughs> the guy next to you was nervous and asked you to ask the question. Um, say it again. Uh, do you think the economy is in danger of overheating? Uh, because you talked about being at historically low unemployment rates combined with tax cuts. Do you think yeah, that's we possible? We spend a lot of time trying to think about that. And uh, as a reminder, economies overheat uh, in multiple ways. Um, one obvious way is inflation. That if you can't find enough workers or you can't uh, find enough goods, prices go up. Important part of our mission is price inflation, and so we monitor that carefully. And it's hard to find meaningful inflation over target as a sign of it. So we don't see that inflation, uh, at least not yet. Um, a second way they overheat is financial institutions take on more leverage, take more risks. And again, through our supervision function, we have the ability to watch the banks uh, very carefully. 
and we're pretty comfortable at this point that the banking system is solid, capital levels are high. We're always aware that we don't know what we don't know. And so we're continuing to dig on a constant basis to try to find those signs. Again, we haven't yet seen that. Um, and then the third way they overheat is supply constraints, which is you just can't get enough of whatever. And I do think there are parts of the economy that are facing supply constraints today. Uh, truck drivers is a classic example. You talk to everyone in every industry you, you talk to, they cannot get truck drivers, they can't get load logistics done. So that's a place we've got shortages. I've heard people say nurses are in a shortage. Um, skilled trades, construction, I mean, that's another place you hear uh, shortages. IT, that's another place. So you're starting to hear some shortages. I wouldn't say it's yet gotten to overheat, but it's something I'm watching and we're watching pretty closely. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, I had a question. Um, how do you set the interest rates? Like, how do you determine that? Uh, well, let me, I guess, talk about process and then I'll talk about logic. Um, the process is uh, we have a committee of 15, I guess it's 16 people now, um, eight of whom do vote every cycle on one of the voters this year, who uh, have a two day meeting where we discuss economic conditions. We discuss various options for the policy path going forward. And we decided that meeting whether to keep the rate the same, to raise it, or reduce it. Uh, based on our decision, the New York Federal Reserve pays out a level of interest on reserves that supports that decision. So process-wise, they're actually able to intervene in the market in ways that sets the rate that we want to set. So that's the process answer. The logic answer is a lot more complicated which is uh, we have a lot of history. We've done a lot of study on an economy which is imprecise and ever-changing. Uh, we do have some pretty basic theories. If you raise interest rates, that will restrain the economy and will, over time, drive prices down, right? If you lower interest rates, that will stimulate the economy and over time will drive prices, assets, and also uh, in prices up. And with that one tool, we believe we're able to you know, put our foot on the gas or put our foot on the brake. Um, it's inaccurate because it doesn't happen immediately. You know, influence works with a lag. But, you know, we are trying to understand, to your prior question, do you have an economy that needs stimulus or one that needs restraint? And therefore, which direction do you want to go? Okay, and is that just like a shot in the dark? Or how much do you need to hit the brake? Or how much do you need to hit the gas? I don't think I'm going to say it's a shot in the dark. That would be very good. Uh, uh, well, so different situations have different needs. So you may remember in 08, um, Lehman Brothers went down, Mass Bank, we took rates down quite a lot because we felt we didn't just need to hit the gas, we needed to floor it, right? And we kept them on for a very long time because the economy was in a lot of trouble and we felt we really need to keep it on. There have been other times where you just tap on the brakes. Right, we just take it up 25 or 50 basis points as a bit of a signal to try to slow things down. And that's always the choice you've got. Do you go up, do you go down, do you keep flat? And how far up, and how fast, what's slow? And, and so it is very much system uh, situation dependent. Okay. Yeah? You said the process is complicated. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we, we monitor unemployment, which is people looking for work who can't get work. And we also uh, measure various elements of underemployment, including people who are working part time who'd rather work full time, and, uh, uh, you know, people who've been looking for a job recently but just recently quit. Yeah, there's lots of various measures of it. Both unemployment and underemployment have dropped precipitously since the peak, and both are at lows over the last you know, pretty lengthy uh, period of time. We don't measure people who were history majors and not able to get a job in history. So that's a, that's a different kind of underemployment, or people don't like their jobs very much. But we do, we do try hard to measure not just do you have a job, but does the job give you the hours and the, that you want? Yeah? 